My name is Michael Rowe. I'm a professor of psychology and dean of the School of Psychology, Family, and Community, which is hosting tonight's lecture with Carl Iverson. We're very pleased you're here. I'm so pleased to see so many of my emeriti faculty colleagues. It's grand to have the elders here tonight among us. We feel honored with your presence. Permit me to introduce our uh, lecturer, but first let me give you a sense of the structure of tonight. Dr. Diverson will present a public lecture. That will be followed by a response from Dr. Mike Hamilton. We'll then open it up for an open uh, question and answer period, and then we'll close with a reception in the back. Does that sound good? Yeah. All right. Dr. Carl Diverson one of America's leading scholars working at the interface of science and religion. His PhD is in physics. He taught at the college level for over a quarter of a century. And in fact, he received numerous recognitions, including three master teacher awards. For those of us who are teachers, that has great meaning. That has great meaning. He is a prolific author on science and religion, with more than 200 articles, reviews, and essays, and nine books. His books include Saving Darwin, a Washington Post Best Book of 2008, The Language of Science and Faith with Francis Collins, the Director of National Institutes of Health, and his most recent with uh, Randall Stevens and published by Harvard University Press, The Anointed Evangelical Truth in the Scientific Age. Evangelical Rejection of Reason. That was the title of an October 2011 New York Times editorial by Carl Diverson and Randall Stevens, although Carl assures me that the title was chosen over his objections by the New York Times editor. But he does find himself studying evangelicals who find themselves facing a challenge of secular knowledge, and that will be the focus of this public lecture tonight. Mike, I'd like to introduce you right now as well, if I may, and then you can simply follow immediately. Dr. Mike Hamilton will be our respondent tonight. Dr. Hamilton is Associate Professor and Chair of History here at Seattle Pacific University. His research interests focus on religion and American culture, American fundamentalism, and evangelicalism. A scholar in his own right, Dr. Hamilton has written, has, has many writings, including Women, Public Ministry, and American Fundamentalism, 1820 to 1950, The Elusive Idea of Christian Scholarship, and Forthcoming, The Organizational Structure of American Evangelicalism. Thank you, Mike, for being with us. So without further ado, would you please help me greet Dr. Guyerson for a stimulating public lecture. back to uh, South Pacific and care uh, of Walsh Shepherd in uh, particular who I come to appreciate uh, greatly through my business up here and a brief sojourn that we had at a summer program in uh, Venice. It's hard not to enjoy everybody that you meet uh, in Venice. Uh, let me just say a word about uh, this room. Uh, I gave a talk in this room uh, three or four years ago when I was doing a book tour shortly after the publication of Saving Darwin. And uh, when, you, when you give talks, the, the way the evening goes is kind of a combination of how big the audience is, whether they comfortably fill the room, and how they respond, and whether the technology works fine, and whether you feel rested. And, uh, and so on. And all of those things just came together in a very nice way for me uh, when I was here on my last visit. And, and that talk that I gave in this room remains to this day my, my favorite uh, public speaking uh, experience. Uh, this, this room was filled uh, largely with, uh, with students, many of them were Paris, and uh, there were a few sitting cross legged here in the front. And these, these stairs were uh, occupied by people sitting. Sitting there, it was just a wonderful evening. So I'm uh, really happy to be back at uh, at SVU. Uh, so I want to make a few just very uh, summary remarks that uh, will give you a, a bit of an abstract uh, of the book uh, The Anointing: uh, Evangelical Truth in a Secular Age. Uh, I will tell you how the book originated, and you can uh, kind of see. 
know, the, the, the kind of thinking that my co-author and I, Randall Stevens and I, you know, were engaged in as we explored this topic. Uh, I went into Randall's office. He's a history professor at Eastern Nazarene College. Uh, he's currently in, uh, in Norway on a Fulbright uh, scholarship, but uh, he and I uh, often have lunch together. So I was in his office, and I was on a kind of a rant uh, complaining about Ken Ham and his creation museum. Uh, I just had some experiences with some students in my class that had watched Ken Ham videos in their science class growing up. And, you know, they were wrestling with this, and it was just very annoying to me that this kind of strong anti-science project there in Kentucky was so influential that Ken Ham was enduring such uh, a pernicious and widespread influence on so many uh, evangelical Christians. And so I kind of ranted uh, like that. Uh, and when I finished, uh, Randall Stevens said, uh, well, that's interesting that you, know, you have that kind of a guy in science. You know, we have that same kind of a guy in history. And he went on a very similar rant about uh, a uh, amateur historian named David Barton that has a kind of similar big, huge media uh, outreach you know, like Ken Ham and, and how many Christians get their history from David Barton uh, when rank and file uh, 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 genuine Christian historians like Mark Knoll and, and Randall Stevens uh, are just kind of horrified at the, the various things that David Barton says about, uh, about history. So, so this got us thinking a little bit about how it was that certain individuals with kind of odd ideas that are outside the mainstream of the conversation that they're in, uh, people without conventional credentials and not affiliated with academic institutions, how they manage to be so influential to shape the evangelical worldview, while at the same time their uh, very well respected colleagues who are also evangelicals, uh, who made contributions to the field, are largely ignored and in many cases uh, completely unknown. Uh, so, uh, so that's what uh, the book The Anointed is about. How is it that certain individuals rise to positions of great influence while uh, others remain relatively, uh, relatively unknown? So uh, that's the uh, sort of crazy. So uh, let me just make a few comments from the book. I disagree with these experts, said Don McLeroy, the intense balding chair of the Texas State Board of Education, speaking a distinctly non-Texan clip. The board in Texas was in the middle of the massive revision of the state's public school social studies and science curriculum. Texas conservatives, many of them evangelicals like McLeroy, have been focusing on three simple words in the <coughs> curriculum, strengths and weaknesses. Their wagons were circled around these three words in a final act of confrontation. These three little words were all that remained after decades of legal wrangling had steadily pushed the biblical story of creation from America's public schools. Many of the country's millions of creationists considered this a scientific, cultural, and moral disaster and added economic insult to intellectual injury it had been paid for with their tax dollars. Since the late 1980s, in an effort to mollify Texas creationists, state curriculum guidelines had mandated the teaching of the strengths and weaknesses of evolution, teaching that the godless theory of evolution had weaknesses, at least offered hope that the creationist beliefs of Texas school children might not be completely destroyed by the public schools. McLeroy, like many Texas evangelicals, enthusiastically <coughs> endorsed young earth creationism. He believed that the best scientific evidence, the sort provided by real experts, pointed to the earth being 6,000 to 10,000 years old just as he thought the Bible taught, not 4.5 billion years old, as the scientific community contended. Moreover, evolution was not a fact. It was just a theory. In March 2009, McLeroy and other board members had heard several scientists testify that the board needed to take the theory of evolution seriously. The word theory, as used in the scientific community, these experts emphasized, meant more than hunch, a popular misuse of the term, commonly employed to great effect by critics. Brown University biology professor Ken Miller, uh, a Christian, warned that the idea that evolution is riddled with weaknesses does Texas a disservice 
by implying a false sense of uncertainty in evolutionary science. The self-assured McLeroy was a dentist. His expertise resided in areas far removed from the science <coughs> of human origins, although he consistently presumed to pass judgments on the conclusions of the scientific community. He invoked other authorities that he thought were more credible and certainly more congenial to his faith. A similar controversy swirled around American history, a subject that also came under the board's watchful eye, and that was even further from McLeroy's field of knowledge. Nevertheless, he was convinced that he had a legitimate concern about the teaching of history, just as he did about science. For too long, he and his fellow conservatives complained, students had been taught a distorted, liberal version of American history. Teachers intentionally made students feel bad about America's many crimes from its checkered past, slavery, the treatment of Native Americans, and the oppression of women. Yet children knew little about the triumphs of the new conservatism from the early 1960s to the present. They knew even less about the entrepreneurial heroes of industry like Carnegie and Rockefeller, who embodied America's greatness. Why were they not as celebrated as Babe Ruth, the hero of America's national pastime? Most important for McLeroy, Texas students were not learning about America's godly heritage. Christianity has had a deep impact on our system, he told the New York Times. The men who wrote the constitutions, wrote the constitution were Christians who knew the Bible. McLeroy made this claim with the support of fellow Texans like David Barton, an amateur Christian historian, popular speaker, and Republican leader. The self-taught Barton suggested to the board that students should understand that Christianity was the key to American exceptionalism. America's founding principles and even the Constitution were rooted in a biblical understanding of the fall and human sinfulness. The public school curriculum, advised Barton and others, should emphasize that Christianity is a force for good and the reason for America's strength among nations. Barton and other presumed expert advisors also questioned the liberal focus of textbooks. In their estimation, civil rights leaders like the labor organizers Cesar Chavez and Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall received too much attention given their meager achievements. The concerns animating McLeroy and the millions of Texas cheering him on are greatly heightened by their deeply held religious sensibilities. Many, perhaps most evangelical Christians from Maine to California would share the concerns of their fellow believers in Texas at a secular, liberal, elitist minority held sway in the public schools and had jettisoned the traditional God-honoring and patriotic curriculum for one that undermined their values and corroded their faith. A godly leader challenging this state of affairs might seem heroic and quickly gain their support. A secular leader would engender mistrust. McLeroy's confidence in his alternative curriculum testifies to the power and inspiration of evangelical leaders like Barton and others who have challenged secular knowledge and authority. <coughs> such leaders have undermined the academic status quo in such a way that a multitude of lay Christians are comfortable now standing up to the so-called experts, confident that there really are two sides to all of these questions. That McLeroy and his committee were able to persuade textbook companies to negotiate the content of their publications testifies to the remarkable political, cultural, and economic power of American evangelical Christianity today and its influence on public life. Is this a rejection of reason? Is this the proper way to understand this response to the proposed curriculum for the public schools that comes through the educational status quo. In our analysis of the anointed, we are carrying on a conversation that has been occurring in America for a very long time, going back to the uh, 60s and earlier. We see our work as specifically building on the work of Mark Knoll in the Scandal of the Evangelical Mind. Uh, in Knoll's work, he's building on <coughs> an earlier uh, purely secular work that won a Pulitzer Prize in the 1960s called uh, Anti-Intellectualism in American Life. 
Uh, Hofstadter outlines the various reasons why Americans in general, and evangelicals in particular, tend to be so comfortable rejecting mainstream knowledge, why terms like intellectual are not necessarily positive terms, uh, why elitist and egghead are names that are often leveled at uh, Harvard professors and other uh, experts from Ivy League institutions. Uh, Noel took Hofstadter's argument and kind of brought it home, wrote a book from the perspective of what he calls a wounded lover, uh, speaking from deep within inside American evangelicalism. He was a professor at Wheaton College at the time, uh, saying that the evangelical mind is a scandal. And the scandal is, he says, uh, and I quote, there just isn't much of an evangelical mind. Uh, so we wanted to pick this up uh, again, uh, revisit the question uh, about the evangelical mind, and, and ask what are the barriers to us developing a robust uh, evangelical conversation uh, that can take place within the field of uh, secular knowledge where we live. Uh, this is a line from our uh, highly edited uh, op-ed uh, where we suggested that evangelical Christianity need not be defined by simplistic theology, cultural isolationism, and stubborn uh, anti-intellectualism. Uh, this was the image that they chose to use uh, for the uh, airhead, balloon head, uh, preacher. Uh, there again, not the image that we created or uh, suggested that they use. Uh, and this was the, uh, the title that was, put, uh, that was put on our piece. So in looking at this tension within evangelicalism, uh, we contrasted the work of different thinkers. Now, one of the characteristics of the leaders that we're calling anointed is that they have an extraordinary power to bring together both the persuasive powers of a great preacher and the credibility of an academic. This can generate great perceived intellectual authority. As purveyors of ideas, the anointed are thus more powerful in many ways than either preachers or academics. In particular, this unique combination makes them much more effective than their more academic evangelical counterparts. And then in the book, and just very briefly what I want to do here, I want to show you this juxtaposition. When Francis Collins was launching his very modest online uh, museum, if we call it, can call it that, at, uh, at biologos.org, which was intended to be a counter to Ken Ham's ambitious project in uh, Kentucky. Collins made no grand assertions that God was helping with this project, despite his confidence that he was indeed doing God's will. Uh, he described the Biologos project as just initial efforts to help catalyze a community devoted to seeking harmony in science and faith. This contrasted with the approach of Ken Ham, who waxed eloquent about God's role in getting his museum finish, finished, describing a fortuitous purchase of some exhibits as one of many miracles in the history of this museum project. Whereas Collins would tentatively hope and pray that his project was in line with the will of God, Ham would state with great confidence that his project was right on the bullseye of God's will. Another anointed leader is James Dobson, who for uh, decades has been a very uh, influential figure. Uh, early in his career, he held a conventional academic post uh, until he launched uh, Focus on the Family. And uh, for the past uh, several, uh, for the past many years at Focus on the Family, uh, he has uh, promoted a, uh, a roster of ideas for preserving the American family, for raising children, for uh, making sure that the genders uh, retain their uh, divinely prescribed roles, uh, and so on. Uh, but over this time, Dobson created great anxiety in the community of professional psychologists because his work consistently uh, contradicted, uh, ignored, and misused legitimate social science research. His comments, about spanking were at odds with uh, social science research. His comments about the 
uh, nurturing skills of fathers, which he said were limited, uh, were shown to be inaccurate by uh, careful uh, peer review studies. Uh, his comments about the emotional and social health of children raised by same-sex parents uh, turned out to be contradicted by studies. Uh, he was consistently opposed to adoption uh, of uh, orphans by, uh, by gay parents, much to the dismay of social workers uh, looking desperately to find homes for uh, children in orphanages. orphanages. Uh, and for many years, although he softened uh, recently, uh, his ideas of the nature of the homosexual orientation uh, have been uh, at odds with social science research, and he has long been an advocate of what's sort of uh, described as kind of pray away the gay uh, to cure yourself uh, of homosexuality. His wrong ideas about the social science, sciences are considered so dangerous that there's now substantial literature out there, uh, much of it written by Christians, uh, trying to undo some of the damage that James Dobson has done to uh, Christian understandings of uh, family, sexual orientation, raising children, uh, and so on. And he stands in remarkable contrast uh, to David Myers, who was a professor at uh, Hope College, uh, author of one of the most popular books uh, in use in the country that literally millions of uh, students have studied from uh, over the years. Uh, and I used a general psychology book from David Myers way back in the 1970s uh, when I was a student at, uh, at Eastern Nazarene. He's a very, very well respected uh, psychologist. Uh, but his influence on Christian thinking about psychology uh, is insignificant uh, compared to that. Of, uh, of James Dobson. The anointed leaders of American evangelicalism achieved their success precisely because of their ability to don the mantle of the academic while employing the communication strategies of the preacher. Whereas David Myers would deliver an engaging lecture on sexual orientation, James Dobson would deliver an engaging sermon. Ken Ham shows pictures of natural phenomena, fossils, or strands of DNA while quoting Bible verses and warning about the dangers of unbelief. It's not an accident that Ham, Barton, Dobson, Tim LaHaye, and others like them are all compelling public speakers. They're witty, comfortable, very articulate. Nor is it an accident that they're all active as public speakers in churches, on the radio, on television talk shows, and in other venues. They present a consistent package of ideas with academic notions confidently interwoven with the faith commitments of the target audience and without complicating nuances. This makes for a forcible and persuasive message. This is uh, David Barton, one of the most extraordinarily articulate speakers you could ever hear. Uh, you can go online and see many of his addresses where he will stand in front of the big American flag uh, and give the most uh, winsome, clear message, an absolutely extraordinary uh, <coughs> speaker. Uh, he is a darling of the right-wing media. He has appeared many, many times on uh, the Glenn Beck Show. Uh, Mike Huckabee uh, says that he wishes that every American could be handcuffed to a chair and forced to listen to all of David Barton's uh, lectures. Uh, Michelle Rockman invited him to come and speak to, uh, speak to Congress. Uh, but historians like Mark Knoll, uh, now in Notre Dame, uh, and John Fee, a respected historian at Messiah College, have pointed out that much of Barton's history is unreliable and very highly skewed. Some historians use uh, more critical language, Mark Lilla has called it uh, schlock. And just yesterday I saw a, an article where David Barton is claiming that one of the reasons why we should not have evolution in our public schools is because the founding fathers objected to there being evolution in the public schools. Now, you can find some uh, language in some of the uh, original documents uh, vaguely suggesting things sort of like that, but certainly what they would have been objecting to uh, 
back in the 18th century would not be the Darwinian evolution that's in the public schools uh, today. And so, so this kind of sort of casual misquoting and misuse of, of history is very characteristic of what, what Barton does and causes other historians to, uh, to roll their eyes and, uh, and lament. Now, no list of influential leaders would be complete without uh, Tim LaHaye, the uh, very successful author of uh, all of these left behind books whose sales are now approaching uh, something like uh, 100 million with a lot of major uh, movies that have been uh, produced there uh, as well. Uh, the Hay is a tradition that goes back uh, a long ways. Uh, Al Lindsay was someone that I uh, read voraciously when I was in high school because he was telling us about the end of the world and how sometime during the 1980s the Soviet Union was going to invade Israel and the uh, second coming uh, would begin shortly after that uh, there. And despite the fact that he has published an entire book, actually two or three of them full of uh, failed predictions, uh, he still is on television and selling books as somebody who was able to uh, tell us what's going to happen in the future by uh, mining proof texts out of the book of Revelation and Daniel and some of the more uh, difficult parts uh, of the Bible. Now, there are authentic scholars within evangelicalism, and he right here, for example, uh, who don't read the Bible this way. Uh, and I love this comment that he made, but the other that he says is a pseudo-theological version uh, of, uh, of Home Alone. <laughs> Christians have long been called people of the book. This label is especially appropriate for evangelicals. But our book is a couple of thousand years old. It's written in obscure languages from a mysterious and incomprehensible time and place. The vitality of our religious tradition depends on the ability of our leaders, our prophets, our preachers, and sages to bring this book to life so that it can engage the worldview of each new generation. Preachers, writes anthropologist Susan Harding, convert the ancient recorded speech of the Bible once again into spoken language translating it into local theological and cultural idioms, and placing present events inside the sequence of biblical stories. Thus renewed, the ancient text remains alive, speaking to a new generation, addressing issues and problems that are often far removed from those that motivated the original authors. Church people, in their turn, borrow, customize, and reproduce the Bible-based speech of their preachers and other leaders in their daily lives, writes Hardy. The DNA of the culture of evangelicalism, which exists alongside and within the larger American culture, is wound from two very different strands. It is an ancient religious tradition, but is also a secular world that's increasingly dominated by science and influenced by forces outside of conservative Christianity. The countless points of contact create complex and bewildering problems for believers, problems that have been with Christianity since its inception. When Jesus said, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's, he was acknowledging this tension, the same tension that led Augustine to write the city of God four centuries later, inspired Aquinas' Summa Theologica in the 13th century. This tension is not one that will be resolved by the clever syntheses of facile televangelists, or will it be put to rest with some sort of intellectual treaty? The timeless ancient book, our book, will be forever asked to speak to a constantly changing world, and prophets will of necessity arise to be anointed and to make that happen. Those leaders most skilled in appropriating both the spiritual authority of the Christian tradition and the secular authority of the present culture, whatever is changing epistemological priorities, will provide that intellectual authority and be anointed to lead. This tension, however, must not be understood as existing between evangelicals and the secular world. This is a tension which is best understood as existing within our tradition. 
The best way to see it, I think, is to place it in the same sort of historical context as Galileo, Darwin, and the Scopes trial. Those classical historical conflicts were not between believers and unbelievers, for there were Christians on both sides of those conversations. Those conflicts were between educated Christians keeping up with knowledge as it was advancing, and those remaining in the past. We're good. Yeah, we're good? Okay, I'll project you. Do my best to project here. All right. um, thank you very much. Uh, Carl was wonderful. Oh, I was going to get the book up here. I'm going to refer to the book a couple times. By its title, The Anointed. So I want to have it here so you just know. Fine book. But read it. Bought it with my own money in a heart bath. Very rarely do that. <laughs> now, in my response, I'd like to invite you to come back with me 60. Years. 1952, an unknown experimental filmmaker, an eccentric bohemian named Harry Smith, assembled a six LP record album, called it the Anthology of American Folk Music. It consisted of 84 songs, all recorded in the late 1920s and early 1930s, and all sold by commercial record labels. These forgotten songs were a revelation to musicians in the 1950s when Smith assembled his anthology. This anthology sparked the folk music revival, which then helped shape rock music in the 1960s. Looking back on this anthology, music historian Mar uh, Griel Marcus described it as an artifact of old, weird America. In this America, birds talk, frogs and mice get married, the dry bones of a skeleton can get up and walk. Ordinary people are bullied by the police, jailed by corrupt judges, tossed out onto the street by dishonest landlords, not paid by their bosses, thrown out of work by technology, and killed en masse when technology fails. Women and men long for love, and woo the day they find it. Many take to drink. One man gets so drunk he mistakes his wife's lover for a cabbage. <laughs> Others rise up in passion and kill their bosses, their lovers, themselves. Still others are lured to destruction by Satan come in the guise of the former one. Heaven is real, but the only way in If the Anthology of American Folk Music is a guidebook to old, weird America, Carl Geigerson's The Anointed is a wonderful guidebook to new, weird America. <laughs> In New Weird America, an actual man and woman named Adam and Eve are the biological parents of the whole human race. Their offspring hunted dinosaurs. This America has been chosen by God to be the agent of his eternal purposes. Its constitution was given by the hand of God, just like the Decalogue to Moses on Sinai. The fortunes of this America follow the ebb and flow of God's favor, which can be called forth through public rituals of piety, by printing religious incantations on money, by organizing ourselves into nuclear families with strictly disciplined children, and most importantly, by forswearing non-marital sex. In New Weird America, the Bible tells us that the world is on the road to destruction, and it gives us a coded list of mileposts we'll pass along the way. Those schooled in the arcana of biblical prophecy tell us, for example, that when the Bible says, quote, the elements shall melt with fervent heat, the earth also, end quote, that this refers to an inevitable nuclear holocaust. Thank you, Kyle Lindsay. And yet, New Weird America also reads in the Bible a countervailing message. The earth may be destroyed, 
that the agents of that destruction are God's enemies. Therefore, if the godly rise up and oppose God's enemies, perhaps global destruction can be averted. Or not. There's one big difference between the two weird Americas. In old weird America, ordinary people are powerless against supernatural forces, or against superior forces, natural and supernatural. Individual rebellion is possible, and sometimes consequences can be escaped, but the strong remain strong, and the weak remain powerless. However, in new weird America, Carl Geiberson's weird America, the weak can organize to fight and defeat the forces of evil, both natural and supernatural. What changed? Why the difference between new weird America and old? The shift traces us back to the birth years of the Republic. The musical sources of old weird America included lower class ballads from European feudal society, work in gospel songs of enslaved African Americans. This was the music of the powerless. But in the American colonies mid-18th century, the forces of change were called forth by George Whitfield, a cross-eyed preacher with the tornado voice. The first great awakening he set in motion taught ordinary Americans that all people are equal in the sight of God. All are born in sin, all are in need of the new birth. The American Revolution taught ordinary Americans that their new birthright was not slavery, but liberty. These two radical ideas, liberty, equality, convinced ordinary people that traditional social elites would be their masters no more. America of the 1790s witnessed full-blown class warfare as ordinary people organized to protest resist and circumvent <coughs> traditional authority and <coughs> control in every area of life, every area of life, politics, law, medicine, communication, and religion. This social revolution of the 1790s, really, many historians have argued, a second American revolution, is the wellspring of new, weird America. Throughout the anointed, Guyerson and Stevens note with wondering puzzlement that new weird America rejects the science and the history and the psychology and the Bible scholarship of credential experts. But in light of the social revolution of the 1790s, this makes perfect sense. Ken Ham and David Barton and James Dobson and Tim LaHaye aren't so much anti-intellectual. They're opposed to rule by elites. In new weird America, the people are sovereign. The people will decide what's true and what's false. Authority does not come from credentials or institutions or God, but from the people. The audience is sovereign, which means the anointed is a perfect double entendre of the title for this book. The people of New Weird America believe their leaders are anointed by God, but in fact, these leaders have been anointed by the people themselves. In New Weird America, the people believe they should rule not only on election day, but every day. Not only in politics, but in science, history, and psychology, and Bible interpretation. New Weird America isn't the product of a mystical force called anti-intellectualism. It's the product of the Second American Revolution. It's popular sovereignty Reductio ad absurdum. After the Civil War, Americans decided that popular sovereignty in some areas of life is not such a good idea. So we, we restricted its reach in politics, law, and medicine, and we used the coercive power of the state to enforce the boundaries. But by far the most laissez-faire area of American life is religion. And more than any other American religion, Evangelicalism has adopted popular sovereignty as its central organizing principle. No wonder, then, that evangelicalism is an ideal petri dish for growing exotic ideas like flood geology or Christian survivalism or dispensational premillennialism. So, 
what then are evangelical intellectuals to do? Is the Antichrist cloaked in the mantle of the people, setting the abomination of desolation among us? Is it time to flee to the hills? I'd like to suggest that there's a less apocalyptic way to look at the phenomenon Guyverson describes so well. One historical study of the 1950s concluded that religion and science were actually engaged in what the author called a democratic conversation. Religion, largely controlled by the people, was determined to have a say in the direction of science. Science, largely controlled by credential bureaucratic elites, was determined to have a say in religion. Here another American principle, that of mixed government, is a helpful guide. Elites, left to their own devices, uh, will too often become jack-booted fascists. Ordinary people, drunk on visions of popular control, are by nature howling mobs. So, America probably functions best when the elites and the people are subject to each other's voters. Next, go. For American intellectuals, for evangelical intellectuals particularly, this means, I think, that we have an obligation to speak in the language of the people, be cognizant of their concerns, and recognize the legitimate spheres of their authority. Fail to do this, and we will reap the whirlwind of the blasphemies that litter the pages of Guyverson's book, like, for instance, the American Patriots Bible. As I said earlier, the evangelicals of new weird America want to organize ordinary people to take back America from the elites. In the throes of this desire, they have yielded to the seduction of the Republican Party, which locked the two of them in a most unholy embrace. Not surprisingly, the culture wars alliance of evangelicalism and the GOP has corrupted both. Evangelicalism has given the conservative wing of the GOP a no compromise, no core, holy righteousness that has all but destroyed the party's ability to govern. And the Republican Party has given evangelicalism a Darwinian hard-heartedness in which strength is worshipped and weakness despised. This highlights a final important difference between the new weird America and the old. Toward the end of The Anointed, there's a four-page section on how evangelicals believe in Satan. Now, I don't know if there's a personal satanic being, but I do believe that evil is real. It's not hard to believe this when you live in a city where a nice-looking, well-spoken young man has just killed his wife, dumped her body, proclaimed himself a loving parent, hatchet-whipped his two sons, and then burned them and himself alive in a house fire. That's old weird. As the anointed shows so well, in New Weird America, Satan has gotten hold of them, our enemies, those pornographers, those gay activists, those secular humanists, those big government socialists. But in old weird America, Satan has gotten hold of us. Sin is everywhere, outside and inside the church. Yes, the elites in authority are likely to be corrupt and heartless. But we, we are just as likely to luxuriate in vainglory, to crush a colleague, to sleep with our best friend's spouse, to murder our parents, all the while deceiving ourselves about our true nature. The world that I live in looks an awful lot like the one that old weird America saw, not so much like the one new weird America sees. Kind of wish, makes me wish that New Weird America would turn off the contemporary Christian music for a while and listen to Sister Mary Nelson from Old Weird America, who sang, Well, all you hypocrite members, you wasting your time away. My God's calling for workers. You better obey. Better get ready for the judgment. My God's coming down. Thanks.
questions have you? What comments have you? Yeah, thank you both for um, two wonderful talks. Um, I would like to ask Carl about um, the um, the vision that is uh, that is introduced on that, about the possibility of resolution with resources internal to the community. And so, what might your blueprint be for such a resolution? Well, I was in a conversation at Seattle Pacific today uh, at lunchtime. Uh, we were talking, you were there, or you? Yeah, so, uh, yeah uh, I mean, I, I think those kind of conversations have to become larger and larger, and we need to do a better job of, uh, of, of, of getting the word out. I mean, certainly in, in communities like this, uh, academically uh, rigorous evangelical communities, it's the authorities there, Francis Collins, that are the ones that will sway, not the ones uh, under Ken Ham's picture um, over there. So there certainly are vast swaths of hope within evangelicalism, but rank and file evangelicals uh, who don't have the opportunity to study in places like this uh, are unable to escape from the sort of study school picture of the world that they are, are getting from the people that we're calling the uh, anointed. So I, I, mean, I think it has to happen with persistent educational efforts, but I think in a sense the, the issue is so large, it's like trying to change American culture as a whole. It's not just something that a modest number of Christians need to address. It's, uh, it, it, it's a national uh, issue that's, that's uh, perhaps concentrated and resonant in a particularly effective way within the evangelical, but it's certainly larger. Uh, larger than that, but I think the kind of efforts that we see at places like SPU are, are where the solution will come from. Oh, okay. Yeah, go ahead. I'd like to follow that. Um, what about uh, elementary schools and secondary schools, Christian schools, and churches as a place where people from Biologos or similar uh, uh, we go and share their views just as the anointed have in those venues. They look like Christian schools. Yes, I mean, that's, that's very important. Uh, Ken Ham has $20 million a year to spread his particular gospel. Uh, and the Biologos Project has a uh, tiny yes. fraction. Uh, uh, of that, but but yes, I mean, those, those are all I think uh, efforts that are moving in the right direction. But it's it's still a big challenge, and it's still unfortunately an issue that's so divisive in many circles that a lot of I mean, a lot of pastors don't want this conversation started. I mean, Francis Collins has been uh, been booed in uh, <coughs> churches when he's been invited to speak. He's had people walk out on him. He's had people come up to a mic. Or the Q and A and accuse him of being influenced by Satan and so on. And just a ter terrible thing. And he has one of the most winsome testimonies you could possibly uh, imagine. You know, so it's it, I mean, it's it's a topic that you can't just <coughs> confront in a benign way. You have to confront it knowing that this is going to be divisive. And you may have some people march out of your you know, Methodist church and go to the Baptist after you've had your total meeting of revolution. Kind of along those lines, given how disproportionately money seems to be flowing into some of the more conservative uh, circles, we just there. I don't know, do you, do you see that as a. Do you see any way of, of leveling the playing field with that, or is there just an entirely different approach that people want to take? What's that? I, I, guess, I guess I wonder also if it should be addressed at a political level, given. A marriage between you know, evangelical circles and the GOP, or whether it not be addressed in the church itself. Kind of, that doesn't probably make a lot of sense, but. Well, I mean, I guess, uh, and I don't mean to answer your question, but let me just oh, make one comment here. But uh, I mean, it would, if you talk about the money that's invested in sort of spreading different messages, uh, certainly 
the, the money that is invested in the educational process here at SBU, you know, at, at Gordon College, down the coast of Westmont, and so on. I mean, that's all sort of on the right hand side of the screen up here. So I mean, there, there, there are efforts being made, and young people are being educated in a, in a way that will, will prove to be very helpful. But one of the, I mean, one of the challenges for students from schools like this when you graduate is whether or not you will be comfortable going back to the kind of church that you grew up in, which would be a church sort of over here on the left-hand side, uh, and, and sort of trying to be salt and light within that church, or whether you will say, oh, I, like, I just don't feel comfortable here anymore, and then you'll leave and go to an Episcopal church where you feel more comfortable. Uh, and there, there is this kind of brain drain out of the evangelical uh, community that many pollsters have noted much hand raising and wailing about how that's happening and how to make it stop. But, you know, it's, it's, a new generation of young people is always an opportunity to do things better than the way their parents did. This one is for you, Mike. You spoke of um, the importance of, uh, towards the end of your talk, of allowing this uh, new wild America its proper spheres. Or something to that effect. I wonder if you would elaborate. I wonder if you would elaborate on that. Tell us what those are and, and how you would demarcate the uh, or negotiate that relationship. If, if it, well, yeah. Okay. So I, I was sort of making an argument that popular sovereignty has a place, and I think people clearly have authority, some some authority over where their children go to school. That means they have some control and sort of say in what children are taught in schools. And I think sometimes credentialed experts behave as though they ought not have any of that authority. We're the experts. We'll tell you what your kids need to know. And I don't think that's uh, either realistic in American society or even necessarily the best idea. So I think what I'd like to see is credentialed experts understand that they can't take refuge behind their credentials. They have, they live in a democratic society and they have to get out and speak in the vernacular and they have to recognize the authority of people to have say in their schools and they have to uh, be able to mix it up with them on a sort of, you know, day-to-day -day kind of basis. And so I guess that's what I'm arguing for is, is for uh, at least to understand that they have to engage this world. Right now, the reflex is not to engage it. It's to say, we're right, you're wrong, you're idiots, and we're not going to talk to you, unless you do it on our terms. Does that make sense? Um, for uh, Richard Dawkins has said that education, like the fight of Ken Ham, is accurate to child abuse in some, in some way. So I'm wondering if you could I mean, I, I think that's an, an, an example of exactly what he's talking about. I mean, that, that's such an arrogant and elitist comment. And to make that comment to a parent who is honestly trying to do what they think is best for their child, and a parent who may have actually taken some time to try and understand questions of origins and may have picked up some unhelpful literature along the way or was going to a church that, uh, that like Ken Ham teaching a lot. And, uh, for, for that parent to hear Richard Dawkins talking to them like that is, is, is so offensive and off-putting that, that even if Dawkins uh, is right, that parent doesn't want to have any input from people who, who think in that way. It's, it's just very uh, anti-democratic to make that comment. So I don't think that's uh, remotely comfortable to any. I mean, to, to call that child abuse, I mean, what, like, what are we, we going to use for real child abuse, right? I mean, if we, you know, if you, if you were to raise children to believe, not that the earth is 10,000 years old, but that they should uh, track down Jews and try to kill them, right? I mean, so former is child abuse, what, what are we going to call the latter? Uh, there? That, that just seems like it's a kind of sort of hyperbolic rhetoric that the internet age has forced us to use so yeah, consistently. You know, much, to the, uh, much to our detriment.
Dr. Iverson, when you were describing the anointing and how they come to have that status, you indicated that they combine the skills of a, of a preacher, and as I understood it, the academic credentials. And I didn't catch that second point of what gives them the anointing, the anointed status. And I one explain that, and two, if they read these credentials, how do they, how does that get recognized in the community? So somehow they've got authority to speak. Yeah, academic. well, like if, if you watch, for instance, uh, they take, take David Barton uh, speak. Like, I mean, he, he's, he's, uh, he does this great job of, of weaving Bible verses into his particular political message. And, and his message is like to go vote for the Tea Party candidates. I mean, that's something that he's been uh, working on for a couple of years now. And, and uh, by the time he finishes with his message, like you, you feel like Jesus has written in the New Testament that you should go vote for the Tea Party candidate. He, he sets it all up and then he, he talks about the importance of going out to vote and he quotes Jesus, go be salt, be light, uh, and so on. And then, uh, and, and so you, you get this message that that sounds like it was a sermon. But it's, a, it's a political uh, statement. And then when he's trying to uh, establish his own credibility to make this sort of a case, that he he uses uh, he invokes sort of scholarly uh, rhetoric and ambiance by talking about how he's got. Uh, he, he's purchased these original letters that founding fathers wrote to each other, so he has the documents and he's read them carefully. And he, he talks about his own research as being more credible and having a higher standard than that of what regular you know, historians like this guy uh, use when they publish uh, things and so on. So that you, you come away thinking that, that he, he's intimately familiar with how the Bible speaks to this issue. He's doing careful scholarly work and he's putting it all together in a package that just sounds too good not to be true. And, and, and all of them speak in that same sort of a way. It's this interesting mix of, of, of ways that you get authority to speak, ways you get sort of a, a spiritual dimension uh, in there, and it ends up being very compelling. Thank you. Can you explain how it is that people, uh, this would be people in my family, who take, uh, accept medical, they go to doctors and they, they accept the authority of a physician for some very advanced treatment, which of course is probably based on Francis Collins' work. And, but there's a great divide there. They, they, can you explain how that connection is not made? Yeah, there's, there's kind of a disconnect in the way science, in, I mean, there's a sort of a picking and choosing, I guess, if you will. Uh, I mean, I, I would say that if somebody were to come out and argue for a completely different approach to medicine, and every once in a while we get people like that, like Jenny McCarthy is trying to convince people they shouldn't get vaccinations and so on, and that's, she's not making, you know, as a former Playboy bunny, she's not making an argument as a credential evangelical. Uh, but uh, but it's the same sort of thing where somebody who doesn't have any real expertise at all, but is kind of interesting for other reasons, uh, is convincing people not to go with what the you know, what the experts are telling us we should do. I think medicine is is uh, is free from having any evangelical objections to how it's practiced, so that you don't have a, you know a David Barton of the medical profession. But I think if one emerged. Even the who would all stop vaccinating themselves and wrap their heads in tin foil and do whatever they would really have the encouraged to do. Uh, Mike, your, your narrative was particularly American, of course. Um, and uh, as in an, um, at a time where we think about globalization, um, do you think that uh, uh, what what do you predict the net effect is going to be? Are we exporting this brand of evangelicalism to the other parts of the world, or are we importing um, uh, different non-American set of, of uh, beliefs and dispositions around the issues of authority? Yes. What do you say? Actually, I'm joking, but not joking. Um, the, 
the argument that we're exporting evangelicalism is overblown. It's, it's, um, the reality is that in the global Christian community, especially in the developing world, Christianity is growing very quickly and looks a lot like evangelicalism in America because of the very um, entrepreneurial, popular sovereignty nature of these societies. So you've got, say, in Africa, virtually no state restrictions on religion. People who can draw and hold an audience are given authority by the audience. So it's not so much that America is exporting evangelicalism. Why worldwide Christianity sometimes looks like American evangelicalism is because the same dynamics that produced American evangelicalism are helping grow Christianity abroad. Does that make sense? Yes. And this, in fact, is not my argument. It's Mark Knowles' argument. Um, so I'll defer to a real expert on this one. <laughs> Uh, there is a certain amount of exporting going on from America abroad, but likewise, here's a surprising factoid. So America is the largest missionary sending country in the world. America is the largest missionary receiving country in the world. We have Christianity from all over the globe coming in, and it's not American Christianity. We're being changed right now by global currents of Christianity. Now, how will that affect these kinds of issues? Good question. Don't know. Too early to tell. <laughs> I, I kind of put two things together. The, your experience with the New York Times editorial and how they edited it on the one hand, and on the other hand, um, your idea of the sort of checks and balances, the idea that the, there is something that the popular sovereignty, popular attitude has to say to the elites. New York Times is kind of a flagship of the elites. Um, I just want to, is, is there something that came up in the process of them editing your op-ed that uh, would, would align with what some of these guys over here on your right are saying about the New York Times having its own view and it's kind of the the bogeyman for them, you know. Um, what could they say to the New York Times uh, that would be helpful with this? Well, could the anointed leaders are on the left say Or just the popular sovereignty more. Um, I mean, what, if, if we're kind of talking about the, the side of the, uh, the elite and that we're, we're speaking with them, they're, they're editing, what positive contribution um, can the New York Times get from New Weird America? I think. Yeah. Well, the choice of title that you objected to is interesting. The Evangelical Rejection of Reason. That's just flat out false. What evangelicals like Kim Ham have is not irrationality, it's an alternative reason. Now, it's wrong. But it's not unreasonable. It's not irrational. You see what I'm saying? You see the difference? And so for the Times to call this a rejection of reason is just muddying the water and sort of um, making it harder to understand the phenomenon. So, so what we have here is an alternative rationality chosen by the people. They say this is the rationality we believe in, but it's not irrational. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that's the first thing I'd say. He was right to object to the title. It's not a rejection of reason. And George Morrison argued this back in 1980 when he wrote his magisterial history of fundamentalism. He said, people have long said fundamentalism is irrational. It's not. It has this alternative rationality. And he laid out very carefully what went into that and so forth. So that's the first thing he said. And I don't, I don't mean to imply that the, that the Times just did a hatchet job and made it so that we couldn't recognize our, our, our piece, but they had a took six revisions before I had a version that the editor was actually kind of okay with. And then, and then the occasion that we wrote this, that, that shaped a lot of the, uh, of the piece, was it was kind of in the middle of the Republican primary debates where 
John Huntsman had kind of become this strange character who believed in evolution and global warming and accepted science, and this was kind of so peculiar that it would have to do that. And we involved you know, Michelle Bachman's husband, who had the Pray Away the Gay Therapy Center, and, um, and, and all that. So, so there was kind of the argument of our book was sort of on display, in a sense, in the opening primaries. Uh, so, so that was the, the context. Yeah. I'm, I'm wondering what sort of evangelicalism you have in mind from the wide variety of evangelicalisms out there. What what is the evangelicalism that you are speaking of? And and how is it that the science of natural selection is viewed as a threat? Or these these various threats? Why why is it that that kind of Christianity feels threatened by these various positions, whether they are scientific, political, psychological. What, what, what is it that is viewed as a threat? What is being threatened? Well, it's, I mean, the authority of Scripture is, the, is really where the battle line is, is drawn in that particular uh, case of David Barton, which is really different than that, but I mean, Ken, Ken Ham is a biblical literalist, and he is committed to the idea that, that ordinary people can read the English Bible, not have to do a lot of scholarly work to understand it, and get God's truth out of that reading. And the Bible is quite clear that things began a few thousand years ago, and the needs of the people, and, uh, and so on, and this is the history of life on this planet not the uh, long history that, uh, that evolution uh, suggests. And so they want to you know, push back against, against uh, secular theories that, in their mind, corrode and destroy even, uh, the authority of the Bible. I think um, if we move to David Barton and the whole Christian America thing, I sort of hate to say this because I actually have a soft spot in my heart for them, but the Puritans originated this. They thought they were actually God's chosen people. They thought they were the inheritors of the promises written in the Bible that were made to the children of Abraham. And they thought this nation would be peculiarly blessed as long as they could keep the covenant. Thought. So that became a part of the American evangelical DNA. Now, it's not unchanged since the period of time. Um, there have been accretions to do that. But I think what that means is a large sector of evangelicalism holds this kind of incoherent God and country view. And that's certainly threatened if you challenge the Christian identity of the founders, at least if you do it frontally. Um, so I think that that's a threat too, and that you're right is different than biblical authority. Does that make sense? I mean, it doesn't make sense to you, and you don't believe it. No. <laughs> if both sides are based on are based on reason, they're not necessarily irrational. How do you best win the other side over, since both think that they have? Reason on their side. I mean, if, you, if, you were to, I mean, if you were to compare Ken Ham and uh, you know and Francis Palm, if you, if you if you got them like in a room together and had a long conversation, I mean, Ken, Ken Ham ultimately ends up totally losing that conversation because he he desperately wants with his sort of alternative rationality, he wants there to be a science that supports his position, but it just isn't there. And there is a, is a way to sort of, in, in layperson's terms, to package this pseudo-scientific alternative so that if you don't look at it very closely and you don't really have much science education, it kind of looks like it might be okay. Uh, but uh, it, it, it can't go kind of head to head. And there aren't very many examples of, of creationists uh, and, and, and evolutionists having conversations where 
the, the, the Francis Collins position gets converted to the creationist position. I mean, the exodus is always uh, the other way. And Ken Hamill next that education kind of destroys the liberalism that he's trying to that he's trying to support. So, so in, in a purely intellectual contest, the, the Ken Ham position doesn't do very well. But the contest is rarely at that level. Then why isn't it irrational if the scientific facts don't support Ken Ham's view? Or well, I mean, it's, it's the peculiar logic of fundamentalism where in, in Ken Ham's mind, we know what happened in the past because God told Moses and Moses wrote it down in Genesis. And if, if you accept that, that we've got the, an eyewitness account from the creator of how things started on this planet, uh, then any scientific evidence that seems to contradict that will, uh, will, will have to be rejected. And, and what Ken Ham and the creationists have tried to do and I think when they began, there was hope that you could produce an alternative scientific model. And this is what was in the Genesis Flood uh, book and, and some of the projects that Henry Morris launched, that where they actually did research, where they tried to really mimic the scientific method and said, let's, let's and this is what the Discovery Institute actually is trying to do right now in their Biologic Institute, is, is to say, let's get rid of the assumption of naturalism and do real research and see if we can come up with a better understanding of the world than what we're getting from the secular scientific community. Uh, but that, that is not working. And uh, Ken Ham, who used to be at the Institute for Trace and Research in San Diego, where some research was actually done, I mean, he left and started his own organization where they don't even make a pretense of trying to do any research. They just sort of state that the real facts of science are on their side, uh, and they try to find a few credentialed people to put on their staff to uh, to make it look like they, they've got some uh, some genuine authority there. Uh, but but they, they can't compete at the level of science. But it's this, it's this alternative logic of saying, well, but God has told us this. I mean, if God told you something directly, you, you, you'd accept that. And if you know your teacher tells you something to the contrary, no matter how well supported it is, you're not going to buy it. I mean, I mean, I think Cam really is sincere when he thinks that God told us how things so the anti-intellectualism is driven by this sort of primordial commitment to the inerrant word, to the inerrancy of the word. Is that what drives it? Or you sort of well, well anti-intellectualism has many, many facets. I mean, there's everything from the sort of the resourcefulness of the cowboy on the frontier to solve his own problems without having to consult with you know Ivy League. Uh, uh, experts on roundups <laughs> uh, and so on. I mean, there's everything from that to, to the belief that you just read the Bible and English without a scholar holding your hand to I mean, democracy. I mean, if, if the you know the, if the Harvard political science professor and, and his janitor both have the same weight in the polling booth, right? They can cast one vote. Then why not give them the same weight in deciding whether climate change is real or whether the Earth is old or young, whether America is a Christian nation or not. There's more to me, probably a lot more to me. So, how do you go about it then? If you have a person like Ken Ham who's so dedicated to saying if Genesis isn't true, why should I accept the rest of the scripture? He's starting from that point when so many Americans are. But how do you start going about getting them to start accepting scientific facts if they're already still a lock in their own life? Take a course from Rob Bell back there, you know, with that. I, I do think one thing when there are on the rare occasions when evolution comes up with a student, I always try to the first thing I it's not going to attack these issues friendly. So I try to separate out the idea that um, the Bible demands a young earth. I don't like to argue the issue itself. Is the earth young? I prefer to say, well, does it really demand it? Is this required by the Bible? 
And you can't convince everyone, but I think with some people you can make headway if you sort of chip away at the edges of these issues. So for instance, when I deal with students on the Christianity of the founders, I'll do stuff like this. So everyone likes Ben Franklin, right? So I'll talk about the friendship between Ben Franklin and George Whitfield. Now evangelicals love George Whitfield. He's one of them, right? So then you talk about this friendship. Cool, they were friends, right? But then you talk about how they used to argue about religion. In fact, Benjamin Franklin was a non-believer, and Whitfield was always trying to convert him. Once you tell a student that George Whitfield spent his whole life trying to convert Ben Franklin, that creates cognitive dissonance, right? But he's a Christian, right? Why would you have to convert him? So, so then you don't need to say much more. You just sort of <laughs> let that kind of work. Or Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson's a lot. Of so with Jefferson, I do something like this. I talk about his alliance with the Baptists in producing separation of church and state and religious freedom, both. And they go, separation of church and state, I don't know about that, but religious freedom, they like that. So then they're friends, but then you talk about Jefferson's Bible, on the other hand, where he pulled out all the supernatural stuff. But I say, but he was still friends with the Baptists. Whoa, okay, now you've got some cognitive dissonance again, right? He's cutting up the Bible and taking out all the miracles, but he's buddies with the Baptists over here. So, so what I try to do is kind of make the water a little murky, you know? But, <laughs> That's my job. <laughs> I'm, I'm still struggling with this evangelical. Um, why, why rehabilitate evangelicalism? Uh, I mean, if, if, if we are, if, if we need to propose a different account of biblical authority that is not evangelical, if we have to propose a different kind of political theology that is not evangelical, and we go down the catalog of all the different things that we need to demythologize to get evangelicalism to start thinking rightly, we are not left with evangelicalism. Let's just call it as it is. Evangelicalism is a waste of time. Let's move on. What is it about evangelicalism that requires us to write these different books and to give these different lectures in the hopes of rehabilitating something that perhaps doesn't deserve to be re rehabilitated or is counterproductive to the church's kingdom work. Well, I, I have one answer to that, why it's worthwhile. Um, you know, of course, Rob, that the mainline Protestantism sort of began taking a nosedive in terms of, of numbers of members. Um, but yet that kind of stabilized. And one of the reasons it stabilized is because so many people who are converted in evangelicalism can't stay there anymore, and then they move into the mainline world. So right now, mainline churches are basically half composed of former evangelicals. So one reason you keep evangelicalism, talking evangelicalism, is keep mainline Protestants, somebody in their pews. <laughs> Wait, I, the question that you've asked is one that I've heard many people phrase in different ways. There's, there's some people who say they want to start using the word post-evangelical, uh, so I'm kind of indicate this. I, I, I'm not a, a historian of American religion, but I, I would be interested in knowing when, when the term evangelical was, was uh, moving into popular parlance in, in that effort kind of back in the middle of the century to kind of distinguish itself from, from fundamentalism. I mean, what, what was there, was there this same conversation? Like, did the fundamentalists say, why do we need a new term? Or uh, what, what, what exactly did they see as this distinction that they wanted to make between themselves? And, and then can, can we understand the frustration in your question now? Is, is it because evangelicalism sort of tried to get free of fundamentalism, but it failed, and it's now kind of collapsing back. I mean, certainly uh, Ken Ham and James Dobson and so on are, are very traditional fundamentalists as they approach uh, the scriptures and so on. So I mean, maybe we're seeing that, that the efforts that were made to escape the straitjacket of fundamentalism failed, and now we have lost that distinction, so the word itself 
has gone back to being fundamentalist and now we have to, you know, I don't, I mean, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I'm kind of asking that part of it, so it wasn't my own. Well, I suspect, that, I suspect the word has always been contested. I don't think there has ever been a normative definition of evangelicalism that we could agree upon. Um, but I think one of the frustrating bits of it um, is, is that you have to uh, take such a long time to explain to another what parts of, of the tradition you can hang on to and what other parts of it that you can't, that it, you, know, you, uh, you get weary by the time you actually uh, get around to having a conversation about whatever it is you wanted to have a conversation about. So I, I just, I think, uh, I'm at the point now where I think the whole discussion about evangelicalism um, is more often than not a waste of time. I apologize, I came in quite late, um, but I'm curious if either of you two have seen the documentary God in America, and if, if you discussed that at all during your lecture, because I think if anyone here has not seen that, they would find it really helpful to see how Christianity, when it did come to America, how it evolved into today's evangelical culture. And I look at, you know, just speaking in terms of, you know, this whole question around evangelicals, it's sort of like, a, I look at it as a, um, just a name given to the present group of people within Christendom that believe that they are the elect as the, some, you know, as the others have along the historical um, process up until now. Um, that it's a dualistic way of thinking they're right, everyone else is wrong. Um, and anyway, I, I found it very helpful in um, seeing how the culture of Christianity in America has changed. Because it's very, to my way of thinking, it's very evangelicalism is, is more cultural to me almost than it is, you know, religious. It's, it's, a, it's cultural. Carl, I was wondering, when, when, when he was trying to press you on the idea that there seems to be an incommensurable relationship between these two uses of reason, if indeed it's an alternative rationality, you seem to still want to say, no, no, there's a univocal rationality such that if Ken and Collins sat down, you know, it'd be pretty clear that Collins is right and Ken's kind of stubborn and wrong-headed and just doesn't get the truth. But if indeed it is two alternative rationalities, reasons that they're giving for what they believe, there may be no third way to settle disputes that all would agree upon. And they may be incommensurable, in, in that sense, not resolvable. I mean, that, that could be, but uh, I mean, it seems relevant to me that anybody who studies biblical languages eventually abandons the Ken Ham reading of the scriptures. So, uh, and, and it's not that like biblical Hebrew has a kind of anti-fundamentalist component to it. I mean, you simply study it the way you study the language. And, uh, and after you've learned enough Hebrew, like you go to Genesis and then you just can't see how Ken Ham can be so, uh, so specific. In, in, and what he finds there. So I mean, it just seems to me that kind of regular, ordinary education uh, pulls you from the left-hand side of the screen here over to the right. And I mean, that, that's why I say that I, I feel like like it's, it's, it's not really a level uh, playing field. Well, sorry, isn't that why they are against education, that anti-intellectualism, because that's the road that it takes you on? Because they are coming from the idea that the Bible is the inerrant word of God, it's literal, it's the truth, and if you stray from that at all, you're not a believer, basically. So if you go down the road of the traditional education, 
then it takes you down this road of reasoning, which is away from this other way, and that's why they're against it. But the point is they're not anti-education in toto. They, they advocate an alternative education. This education has gone wrong. It has ignored important facts. It yes. has distorted others. It reasons badly. It doesn't take divine revelation into account. Yada, yada, yada. So it's not that they're opposed to education. It's just they want education to right. And I would say this might be a minor disagreement between um, Carl and myself because I, when I read his book, the things that kept popping into my mind were Alistair McIntyre's famous book, Whose Justice? Which Rationality? in which he argued that there are multiple rationalities, all of which are internally coherent in this world. I was thinking about um, um, Thomas Kuhn's um, uh, argument that science doesn't proceed in a nice process of orderly development and cumulative knowledge, but in fact it develops paradigms. And paradigms die out, and they're replaced by other paradigms. So we're looking at different paradigms here of the world. Again, it's not your rationality. They have evidence, they have facts, they have assumptions and presuppositions on which they're all built. But it's, it's not precise or helpful to call it anti-intellectual, anti-education, or irrational. That's not where the difference lies. Um, and I think it makes uh, this world feel better to say that sort of thing. Because then you don't have to mix it up with presuppositions, evidence, all that sort of stuff. I, I would agree with that, and I would even contest what Dr. Guyerson has said about just the very simple fact of knowing Hebrew, for example, would decide the question. And the example that came to my mind when you were speaking, Mike, is, is it, is it, am, I, am I correct in remembering that, that for example, Stephen Meyer the Discovery Institute has a Cambridge PhD? You know, I mean, I mean, there are examples of yes, he does have a Cambridge PhD in of, the, uh, of, history of philosophy of science. Um, yeah, so so there are examples of, of people with very high levels of, of what we would consider a sophisticated education, uh, the value education, and so forth, and yet in, retain at least some aspects of this of, of this of this worldview or this uh, paradigm or whatever you want to call it. I I wouldn't put the, the distinction between uh, anti-education and, you know, this other group. Yeah, and please don't think I'm arguing that these paradigms are equivalent. They're not. <laughs> Some are better than others. But all I'm arguing is they do have their sort of internal logic and rationale. I think part of it, too, is teaching people in some churches how to read
Late 19th century, American developments within conservative Presbyterianism. Um, the idea that the Bible was inerrant in the original autographs, as uh, the theologians there put it. Um, it depends, inerrancy depends on a particular rationality that um, is rooted in a certain form of the Enlightenment that was taken into American thought. And it's the idea that you read scripture like the Enlightenment folks read their documents. Um, it's a different way of reading scripture than was read, say, in the 4th century, the 5th century. It's a very American and fairly recent phenomenon. Given the lack of centrality to the Christian faith, and given the divisiveness, of the issue, uh, and given what the responsibility of the church really is, and members of the church, to the church, what role should this debate really have? Is it just to make us look better to to the secular world, or is it to build up the body? Well, I mean, uh, as someone who as a top reporter century, you know, a school like this, I think one of my concerns is that young people are raised with a certain uh, view of the world, and they come to college, and they become educated, and they study biology, and learn about evolution, and so on, and, and this is incompatible with what they were raised as Christians to believe, and so they have a crisis of faith, and sometimes they can navigate that successfully and just become um, more liberal. But quite often they lose their faith entirely. I mean, it was, it was in this room uh, a few years ago when I was here that a young woman came to see me after my talk and, and said, uh, I was raised exactly like you were uh, as a fundamentalist, but I lost all of my faith when I began to study science, and I would like to have it back. I mean, that's, that's sort of hung with me ever since and I've told many people that story. I would like to have it back. And it's not like a liberation. It's, it's a personal crisis. And so we, uh, our churches and Sunday schools are setting young people up for faith-destroying personal crises in Christian colleges like this one. Yeah. Right? I mean, that, that's a disaster. And that's why I think it's important that we do it.